Welcome to Wireless Future. I'm Emil Björnsson and I'm in a rainy Stockholm today. And in Linköping, I have my colleague Eric Larsson. How are you? Good, Emil. Uh, how are you this morning? I'm great. So I was thinking since we are at different locations that we should talk about coverage today. So in particular coverage without beam forming. So I was planning to st- ask you some questions. So uh, what does coverage mean to you? So absolutely coverage. I mean, so coverage in a way is being able to reach out, right? With wireless comms. Mm. And you can think of it like mathematically that, you know, if you drop a pin at random on the map, what is the probability that you will have some pre-specified uh, level of quality of service, say? Uh, Mm -hmm. More broadly, or colloquially speaking, I think coverage is all about making the customers happy for for the operators, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, in fact, covering the cell edges is the difficult thing in wireless communications. If you stand and you gaze at the tower and you see it in, 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 you know, close by or in line of sight, then coverage isn't a big deal. But if you're far away or if you're behind some, I don't know, you're in the basement of a house or something, you don't even have to be far away geographically, right? But that's when it becomes difficult. So coverage is the, say, ability of the system to reach out far away from the base stations or the the access points, where far doesn't have to be, again, geographically. It could also be that someone is just behind some shadowing object or in the the basement of of a house or... Or, or something. So that's really, I think, what we mean by, by coverage here. And to, to So to, to, is this a concept that is applicable both in rural areas and in the cities then? I think, yes, I mean, in the sense that you'll have coverage problems both in rural areas and in cities, right? I mean, in the city, you mm. will have coverage problems only when you are like, deep into the basement of a building or or at some very difficult location because typically you aren't very far away from the access point so um, it's it's like I mean the free space path loss isn't that large right in rural areas coverage problems mainly arise because you're far away in terms of 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 distance and really I mean to cover an area either you have to spend a lot of power at your transmitter to, to reach out or you have to focus that power spatially somehow f- beam form it in, in in the direction where you know that your, your users are located right so i mean these are the only ways of really I- achieving coverage but then maybe your question is also whether you know we speak of because there are in, in wireless comms there are two limiting well there are several major and limiting impairments but two mm. impairments at least are thermal noise to make the received power high enough in relation to the thermal noise and the second is to make the received useful power high enough in relation to interference and when we speak of coverage then very often we really mean to win over the noise right i mean in in dense Mm. deployments in in cities like you said there'll be a lot of interference that typically is the dominating uh, limitation Uh, but when we speak of coverage very often we, we really mean like how can we make sure that enough power reaches the receiver so that the received signal is high enough above the the thermal noise floor. Hmm. So is coverage just one thing or does it depend on what kind of application we are using? I mean, if we are making a phone call or if we want to watch a video stream, is the coverage different or how do we define the metric here? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, obviously, you know, we can define quantitative metrics. Like if if we are using, say, a cell phone only to make phone calls, then it will be like binary. Either the call goes through or it doesn't, right? But if you are streaming video, then it could be that, well, if you have very good coverage, you could get HD quality, say, or or full HD (laughs) or something else. Mm -hmm. If you have like a little bit less... Uh, good coverage then you can still stream the video but you would be you would have to live with I don't know VGA or (laughs) some lower resolution and if you have really poor coverage then the streaming just doesn't work uh, at all to any to any satisfactory extent Um, so certainly I mean you know I mean more like theoretically or mathematically you could think of like coverage as a way of quantifying like you know what is the probability that you can get a certain bit rate and so forth but um, I'm, I'm sure if you were entering that <laughs> very detailed <laughs> discussion and game here but certainly you know you could define metrics like that right yeah I know I s- suppose that coverage really uh, 
at least um, originally means the basic coverage in order to use the basic services and then mm. yeah the, the more we rely on data services it also becomes more a progression between where you are in the cell what kind of services you can mm. actually appreciate right that that that's that 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 i think is valid and we can you know could take that as a basic definition of coverage that it's like binary right either the basic services work or or they don't so mm. So uh, you were mentioning that instead of just uh, uh, like sending out a lot of power, we could beamform the signals in a focused manner. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we should beamform signals, I suppose we need to know where we should focus the signals, right? Right. Because uh, beamforming, I mean, means shooting power into some specific direction in, in space, right? Or uh, transmitting a signal in, in such a way that it... it Focuses reaches a focal point with where with where Lord received power at some specific geographic location, and to do mm. that, you'll need to know where to point this beam, um, obviously. And uh, in general, in uh, say communication theory, one speaks about transmission uh, with and without channel state information. What that really means is that. Either the transmitter knows where is the receiver located so that it can form a beam specifically towards him or the transmitter doesn't, right? So channel state information refers to the fact of the access points here, the base station transmitter to, to, to know where is the receiver located. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, then we have two different categories then to talk about. So let's start with the case when you have channel state information. Uh, how do, do the beamforming work in that case? How so do you obtain you, it? Yeah, so if you if the transmitter or the base station here then has channel state information, that, that means that it knows where the receiver is located. Huh? And uh, Geographically or in some other more abstract manner? Yeah, it could be both. I mean, and to start with here, for the transmitter to be able to adapt where it is sending its or directing its power, it would have to have either a mechanically steerable antenna, like a, think of like a parabolic dish that you could just mechanically steer right, like this, mm. or it would have to use some sort of MIMO or phased array technology where you have multiple uh, antenna elements and each antenna element is connected to some circuitry that you know could change the phase and amplitude and so forth of the, the waveforms that are emitted. And now, um, if we are in propagation with mainly line of sight then in principle you can describe the say location of a receiver by talking about the angle to the angle of departure from the from the the uh, access point right and um, that is uh, typically the case at high carrier frequencies like you operate at millimeter wave or, or, or higher than there's a lot of line of sight propagation there either we have line of sight propagation or, or the signal won't reach at all right so then we mm -hmm. can just talk about like the angle but at lower frequency bands then well there might very well be line of sight but very often there's a lot of scattering and even reflection going on in the in the environment um, especially uh, scattering so that uh, it doesn't always make good sense to talk about like a direction to the receiver but it's rather that you want to make sure that each um, uh, little antenna if you have a MIMO array for example each little antenna knows the has is accurate enough I mean you have channel state information on like a per antenna basis at the access point so that mm. you know the channel impulse response from every little antenna in your MIMO array to the uh, receiver and therefore you can adapt the emitted waveform such that well each antenna emits a unique waveform and these waveforms then combine in the air in such a way that you see constructive interference precisely where the uh, receiver is located so think of like these two regimes right with line of sight propagation we can talk about angles non line of sight propagation with a lot of scattering then instead we have to talk about channel impulse responses uh, per MIMO antenna at the access point and adapt the transmission uh, based on that. Hmm. Uh, and current systems are supporting all of these things that you're describing, right? Yes, uh, of course. I mean, so now what I said here about like um, a MIMO array with, with many antennas and each antenna measuring like an individual impulse response to the receiver, that's the main operational principle behind massive MIMO technology, which is the 
uh, say cornerstone physical layer <laughs> in 5G, right? Yeah. So what if we don't have channel state information at the transmitter then or at the base station? What do we do then? We can still be informed or? Yeah, so I mean, so here's the thing, right? If you if the uh, access point doesn't have channel state information, so it doesn't know in a line of sight scenario, it doesn't know what direction the, the target or the, the receiver is located. And in the non line of sight scenario, it doesn't know these impulse responses or anything. So, well, then you can't be informed, right? I mean, you could be informed, like at, in some random direction or in some fixed predetermined direction, but you wouldn't know whether or not you'd hit your your receiver because you don't know where the receiver is located. So uh, without channel state information at the um, uh, transmitter, at, at, the, at the access point here, then you can't meaningfully uh, be informed. So what do you do then in order to to cover the, the cell, I mean, yeah. in order to reach these uh, <laughs> terminals, right? Well, one thing you could do is just use an omni, a single omnidirectional antenna or something that radiates substantially i mean omnidirectionally right or at least into like some area where you where you know that your your receiver is located it could be like a sector or something yeah. uh, so that's one thing you can do and if you have a mimo array there are also other things you could do one thing is that you could sweep beams so you could like shoot beams like this in different directions if you think of like the angle or think of a two-dimensional plane and then you got like angles from minus 90 to plus 90 degrees and they could like shoot beams in different angles minus 90 minus 89 minus 87 and so forth and, and hope that you'll hit <laughs> the receiver uh, at some um, with some of these beams and the third thing you can do is to use um, diversity transmission schemes also known as space-time uh, codes uh, that essentially generate waveforms that code across both by space and 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 time. So so these are like the main options that you that you'd have if you don't have channel state information at your transmitter uh, antennas. Hmm. Yeah, so we we will talk more about the diversity schemes later. Uh, I came to think about uh, maybe some analogy with uh, big. Uh, yeah lamps for example if you want to light up a football field you you know where the players are supposed to be so you can mm -hmm. use a big uh lamp there to uh but you can also have a flashlight but very narrow width of the uh of the, the light and you save yeah. energy i guess <laughs> and you sweep around in in a way and look for objects somehow so you gotta track the players and then, yeah yeah so exactly or, or i mean way, uh, yeah. uh, maybe uh, on a stage you either are lighting up the entire stage or you are lighting up just where the actor mm. is located mm. okay so a lot of people are talking about 6G now, uh, <clears throat> and in particular, perhaps uh, we have previous episodes about going up in the frequencies towards terahertz bands or things like that. So, in general, then, is this coverage issues changing as we are changing the wavelength of the signals, uh, or uh, is it the same old physics all along? Yeah, so the question really here is, uh, I, I think you meant whether um, it is more difficult or, or whether, whether... Yeah, is it more difficult? Do we need to use other methods? Yeah, right. So is it more difficult to, to get coverage at higher frequencies? And the, the answer is um, partly yes, I mean. So, uh, so here's what happens when you, when you go up in frequency. Uh, to shorter mm. wavelengths, then, well, the, the, the path loss, at least for free space line of sight propagation, doesn't change. But what does change is the effective area of an antenna. So if you have a dipole antenna, then its effective area will shrink in proportion to the square of the wavelength, um, uh, which is the, the reciprocal square of the, the carrier uh, frequency. Um, mm -hmm. So, and that will directly affect your link budget. Uh, and the only way of making up for that loss is to use antennas with a larger aperture. And um, to increase the aperture of the antenna, then you could either build like a dish or something that is just physically larger, or you could build uh, something like a phased array or a MIMO array that com comprises of many small independent antenna elements that are electronically controlled or interconnected in some way. But now, once you increase the aperture of the antenna, you also increase its directivity. 
which means that yes, we could recover this loss in the link budget that stems from the decrease in effective area of the antenna when we go up in carrier. But to make up for that loss, we would need to use antennas with directivity, which means also that we would need to know where to point these antennas, either physically or by controlling the, the small individual elements that they are um, made up of. So in that respect, mm. uh, getting coverage at higher frequencies uh, is more difficult, yes. Yeah, it's a very important thing that you're pointing out there because it, you can often hear people say casually that if you go up in frequency, you get worse uh, path loss. And then it's so important that the, the path loss formula always measures both mm. the signal loss over mm. there and the transmit and receiver antenna. So it's very hard to decouple this unless mm. you, you, you do it in a way that you explained. Mm. Yes, and, and it's an important misconception, I think. I mean, the, you know, the, the thing is the path loss does not change when we increase the carrier frequency, but the effective area of the antennas do. And that's why we get this um, loss in the link budget. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, sometimes you also see like claims that, well, in fact, uh, it isn't more difficult to establish <laughs> coverage or, or reach far at high carry frequencies. You just use an antenna with a larger aperture. Certainly that's true. But the catch is that to use an antenna with a larger aperture, you need to know more precisely where your receiver is located and therefore orient your antenna either physically or have like a, some advanced I mean, say MIMO array or something right but if it's just mm -hmm. you know one radiating like element then you'd have to physically orient the antenna towards the target so you need um, a lot of prior information on where your receiver is located anyways yeah yeah <laughs> maybe there's, there's just one more detail around that that even if the loss over there is the same irrespective of the carrier frequency the interaction with different objects like penetration for buildings and things like that could still be be different and make it worse at higher frequencies. Certainly, that's a good point. I mean, you know, we said the path loss doesn't bring carry frequencies is only really not exactly true. I mean, there, there are, for example, there are some certain bands where, you know, rain in the air could mm. interact with the waves and, and cause enormous drops. But in, but in general, I mean, if you just think of free space uh line of sight propagation in 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 vacuum then <laughs> there is no wavelength dependence so that's that's the point i think yeah so uh, let's go back then to be informed without channel state information again so when i'm teaching mimo theory I, I like to talk about oh there are three types of gains that you get from having antenna rays it's like beam forming gain there's the multiplexing gain and there's a diversity gain so which one of these can you achieve without channel state information? Yeah, so you certainly can't get the beamforming gain, right? Unless you have like an antenna that you orient physically, a high gain antenna that you orient physically that points into some specific direction. Um, or you mm -hmm. have a phased array or MIMO array where you like configure it to, to beam into some specific direction. But then of course you don't know whether your receiver is located in that direction or not. That's the point, right? When you don't have channel state information. So, so really you can't get useful beamforming gain if you don't know where the uh, receiver is. Um, and then you mentioned, I think the second was multiplexing. Uh, so mm -hmm. multiplexing in uh, in MIMO all stems from the ability of the array to send multiple beams at the same time into different directions or focus power onto like different spots in, in, in space. And that you certainly cannot do if you don't have channel knowledge or channel state information. And the third you mentioned was, I think, diversity gains. Um, so diversity gain... Um, is um, refers to the fact that, well, if you have like an, um, let's say, um, array antenna with, um, you know, maybe 100 elements or something, and then you have a, a receiver somewhere with um, perhaps a single antenna, and you have independent fading across the, the, um, the, the array, then uh, you'd have like 100 chances of getting the signal through, right? So that's known as diversity. And another name for that, by the way, is, is channel hardening, which I think is more common in the, in the modern MIMO literature. And that you certainly mm. can get. 
without um, without chance state information, without knowing where to point the beam. I mean, you can still use, as I mentioned earlier, this beam sweeping or diversity schemes or space-time codes to, to, to harness this diversity gain, the fact that independent fading across the array uh, gives us many chances to get the, the information through. So you, you mentioned that multiplexing gain is not something that we can achieve. Is this, uh, were you thinking particular about like multiplexing of different users or uh, if we have a receiver with multiple antennas that have channel state information, can it decode multiple streams still? Oh, uh, you could, I mean, you could of course think of a uh, no you could send multiple streams if the receiver had multiple antennas that is certainly correct i mean you'd have a point-to-point mimo channel and essentially is that what you mean yeah then i guess the difficulty will be to how to know how to encode it so that you can actually decode the signals but yes i, suppose I you mean can in, in, in principle i mean recoder. Yeah, you could, exactly. I mean, you could send multiple streams, but really to get any performance out of it, you would need this channel state information. Yeah. So um, t- traditional base station before, maybe 4G or 5G, where this uh, high gain kind of antennas that are, we might not call it beam forming, but they're still forming a very directive antenna mm-hmm. uh, beam uh, towards maybe it's uh, going down towards the ground not up into the air and then it's supposed to fill the sector uh, and I think one of the engineering problems that you come across then is that you you put it on a rooftop or in a mast and you choose your um, tilting and uh, yeah mm. horizontal and vertically and mm. is that a kind of like predefined beam forming where you can still uh, try to tilt it so you get the best coverage? Yeah, I think you could say that. I mean, so this becomes a little bit like a question of semantics, I think. What does beam forming mean, right? Uh, if mm. you have like a fixed, you have a high gain antenna, which is essentially what this is, right? Although it, it might be like, it look like some kind of a grayish panel and composed of many small antenna elements that are interconnected with a um, microwave phase shifter networks and so forth, then certainly you could call that beam forming i think i mean and you're right that traditionally then these have rather high gain both in 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 azimuth but especially in elevation and then it becomes important like how to tilt them and how to orient them and how to actually mount them physically on the tower um so certainly but of course again the point is that you know because these are high gain antennas you will need to know exactly how to point them right or or, or you'll Hmm. need some mechanism in order to adjust (laughs) where they are pointing depending on like traffic load or or um, um, maybe other factors. Yeah, I suppose if you uh, are providing coverage of a certain number of kilometers in the countryside, you can try to tilt it in such a way that you're focusing your fixed beam towards the edge of the cell or something like that. Uh, uh, because right. that is m- maybe where you had the biggest coverage issues. Right. So... Uh, now when we are talking a lot about beam forming without channel state information uh, i suppose many will wonder what do we need this for Mm. is there anything in today's systems that is transmitted in this particular way Mm. i mean so so reach or transmitting information without channel state information would be either in order to reach users for which we haven't established yet a closed loop operation so that we know where they are and can be informed to them. I mean, it could be that you want to wake someone up, for example, I mean, a, a terminal, right, or a cell phone, or send a paging mes- message, or send, I mean, which is like a message of the sort that please uh, wake up and send something back so that we can locate you and figure out the, the channel knowledge or, or channel state information to you so that we can be informed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is that the systems also broadcast lots of information like every tower every access point broadcasts information of the sort that look here is tower number 5043 uh, if you want to contact with me please use the following procedure and uh, so that's known as system information 
And uh, then, I mean, more more traditional is like, well, there might be a lot of things that are of interest to everyone, right? It could be even like a TV broadcast, for example. There's no point in beamforming it um, if you know that pretty much everyone will will uh, potentially be willing to receive it. But in in uh, modern, say, wireless standards, it's really the system information and um, paging or, or wake up uh, messages that are sent this way. So t- two terms that I sometimes come across when reading about uh, yeah, beamforming without channel state information is open loop beamforming and slow fading. Uh, what are these terms meaning? Yeah, so uh, we got to be careful here that we don't conflate terminology, I think. But to start with this open. And, so there's this, uh, say, term open loop beamforming and also closed loop beamforming, right? And mm. that just means open loop means transmission without channel state information. So this is essentially just another word for that. Uh, think of it like a control loop that isn't closed, right? So the controller has no mm. idea really what to do. And then you just... If you, well, if you don't have channel state information, you just transmit omnidirectionally all over the place. Uh, in contrast, closed loop um, operation, then we have channel state information so that we can form beams or, or focus power. So, so these are just two terms that are used um, more or less um, as um, um, equivalent to, to having versus not having channel state information. And mm. what was the other term that you mentioned? Um, it's slow fading. Oh, yeah, slow fading. Oh, um, yeah, so that one, I think, is... So slow fading, I think, is one of the terms that is very often being misused because in mm. when we teach wireless comms, right, and we talk about fading as a phenomenon, and fading has is composed of two um, parts. There's the large-scale fading, which includes, like, path loss and, and shadowing in a very typically slowly. And then there is the small scale fading, which is like Rayleigh fading and so forth. And I rather prefer to talk about large scale and small scale fading uh, than slow or, or, or fast. Slow, slow just refers to how fast does it vary, right? And that depends on like how fast is <laughs> your terminal is moving and all that. Um, mm. Yeah, so maybe that's what is what you meant here. <laughs> yeah, no, I think in some cases slow fading is also used um, as the scenario where you sort of transmit uh, there you only see one channel realization uh, and uh, the receiver uh, i guess in textbooks it's sometimes used where you the receiver knows a channel the transmitter doesn't know the channel uh, but there's just one realization and you need to use outage measures in order to oh yeah i see what you're after here so that's true uh, sometimes we'll talk about fast and slow fading in in um, let's say more information theoretic uh, context mm-hmm. or notion where Fast fading means that we have a code word and uh, it's it sees many or like an infinite number, but at least many different channel realizations, right? So there is a code that spans across many different channel realizations. We talk about slow fading is like, well, each code word sees only a single realization of the randomness uh, in the channel. And so, so that, that, that certainly, and, and, and that's, a, I think, a good and legitimate use of, the, of that terminology, certainly. Mm. So, uh, is there anything in between the case with no CSI and perfect channel state information? Could we have some partial information or know something about the group of users or yeah, other smart yeah. cases? Right. So certainly, yes. I mean, for one thing, you might have like partial channel state information, which means you know something about the receiver where they are. Um, it could be like, I mean, in, in the most elementary form, it could be that you know that the receivers are in some kind of sector or some limited geographical area, right? And if you have that sort of information, then even a fixed high gain antenna, if you tilt it and point it appropriately, that would do good. You know, I mean, that would like make the best use out, out of this limited channel state information that you, that you have. So certainly mm-hmm. you might know something but not exactly the angles or, or directions and, and locations and so forth and you could exploit that knowledge to do some kind of maybe not exactly beam forming but still some kind of partly directional transmission at least and the other thing is that there are also situations where uh, a single beam 
might be good for more than one receiver at a time, even for a transmission of like dedicated information, right? And that's known as multicasting. So say, for example, that in, in, in a cell there are several users out there who, who are interested in receiving uh, the same TV show or, or something that's going on in real time. So then, mm. well, rather than just pretending we don't have channel state information at all and just broadcasting omnidirectionally, we could form a beam which is good for many users at the same time and this is possible with for example this can be done with massive MIMO technology and one trick that can be used here is to use a shared pilot so that this becomes a bit technical now but it's just like the transmitter array at the access point then obtains not channel state information to a single one of these receivers but rather a linear combination of the channel impulse responses to all of them and then when it later beam forms it's like shooting multiple small beams at the same time which then <laughs> reach these um, receivers that are interested in, in receiving the very same data stream so certainly um, this is a whole world of, of <laughs> research and development of course to refine I mean the sort of protocols but um, in, in general terms mm. um, exactly like you said uh, one could exploit also partial information about the, the channels yeah, and I think you're also raising an important point there that when people like you and me are talking about beam forming, we are not meaning that we necessarily send a focused angular beam like a flashlight in a particular direction, but more in a generalized form that we transmit with a certain directivity meaning that uh, yeah as you mentioned we focus a thing at one location or at a multitude of locations and we design the transmission so we get that focusing we're not so uh, much caring about how the signal look like close to the transmitter whether it looks focused there as long as it reaches the, the location where we want it to be mm. so in the beginning you talked about the beam sweeping I guess and also diversity schemes uh, I was thinking we could um, go in a little bit more detail on this uh, are, how are these relate to each other is one better than the other mm. yeah so so let's see let's recap so beam sweeping sweeping meant that you shoot like a beam first at minus 90 and then at minus 89 and then minus 88 degrees and so forth right and diversity mm -hmm. scheme, they're also called a space-time code, is more that you, you create some set of waveforms that are individual for each antenna, and then you transmit these waveforms and hope that the effective radiation, you, you, your transmission, you get is omnidirectional, right? Um, so in a way, it's like beam sweeping is a special case of space-time coding or of a diversity scheme. You can think of beam sweeping as a repetition code, more or less, that you... You send some piece of information in direction minus 90 degrees and then you send the same piece of information in minus 89 degrees and so forth and hope that well at least some of <laughs> these uh, beams are, are, are useful and we reach the receiver so in that respect uh, diversity schemes and space-time codes are much more general and therefore better in general right mm -hmm. uh, there's one thing though here which is slightly more subtle and um, but still important and that is that for with a diversity scheme it might be that the, the space-time code you send code over a substantial period of, of time and then the receiver has to be awake over all that time and listen and integrate coherently so integrate here means like collecting samples and combining them coherently in phase in some manner whereas with with beam sweeping it's really enough that at a very little instant in time where the beam hits the receiver that it can listen during that very little instant in time and decode something and then when the beam is beams are sent in other directions then that receiver isn't illuminated at all and it doesn't matter whether whether it is asleep or whether it i mean it doesn't have to integrate samples combine samples coherently or anything so so there are some advantages to beam sweeping over uh, space-time coding, although fundamentally if we assume that the receivers are sufficiently capable, then space-time coding is always better than beam sweeping. Okay, yes, yeah, so you were it was clear to me what the, would be the potential benefit of the beam sweeping, uh, but in, what, what was the benefit of the diversity schemes, if you can be... Uh, well, it's like, uh, it's like with, a, with beam sweeping, it's like a repetition code. Huh? 
whereas with a, with a with a space time block with a space time code you can achieve a higher transmission rate so think uh-huh, of it like in yeah so i mean it's like in isotropic fading indeed then beam sweeping is equivalent to antenna hopping sending you know you got two antennas say and mm-hmm. what you could do is just either sweep a beam a beam pointing like westwards and then a beam pointing like a bit of eastwards yeah uh, and the same information in both beams. This is mathematically equivalent in isotropic fading to antenna hopping, using the first antenna first to send the packet and then turning it off and use the second antenna to send the packet. Uh, that's mm. repetition coding. Uh, in contrast, with, with a space-time code, you can send two packets <laughs> with twice the rate and still have them transmitted omnidirectionally. Um, so in that respect, beam sweeping is just like a... Uh, uh, <laughs> very restrictive or, or, or not so good um, let's say special case uh, of, of di- mm-hmm. uh, the diversity scheme yeah. I heard about something called the Alamutti code is that also a special case of space time codes or oh yeah so I mean that was the first space time code that was invented right I think it was back in 1998 and uh, it's a very clever scheme, you know, where you, you use uh, two antennas uh, to transmit one symbol per, per, per channel use and uh, in a way that's omnidirectional, so you get second order diversity uh, if you receive with a single receiving antenna. And uh, this invention by Sivas Alamutik, and I think it was, it was end of the 90s, I think it was 98, spawned this whole field of uh, re- research and development into space-time codes and especially space-time block codes, uh, where uh, so the Alamutis scheme is, is, is an instance of a space-time block code for two uh, transmitter antennas. And more generally, I, I suppose you have written a book on the space time block codes, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, w- w- what does it contain? I- is the sort of the, the theory still relevant today, or have everything moved on? Is a lot have been happening since you wrote it? Oh yes, of course. I mean, so uh, this is. I mean, <laughs> that's amazing. It's twenty <laughs> years ago almost. But so yeah, mm. we wrote this book, uh, Space Time Block Coding for for Wireless Communications, and uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to like enter this field at the right time and um, write. I think, if not the only, at least the first, <laughs> uh, say, a textbook style exposition of the topic. And uh, it is certainly something which is highly useful. It's there. It's used in the standards. Uh, now this becomes a little more like detailed or technical, but within the world of space-time codes, there is a subclass of space-time block codes, which is what our book is about. And the special case of that is Alamutis scheme. And then that's for two transmit antennas. Then for general number of transmit antennas, there are non-orthogonal space-time block codes and orthogonal space-time block codes. Mm-hmm. And orthogonal space-time block codes have uh, some very attractive properties. Um, for example, they facilitate ex- extremely simple decoding at the receivers and so forth. Uh, the problem is that beyond two transmit antennas, you, you have to compromise the transmission rate. So, so full-rate orthogonal space-time block codes don't exist for more than two transmit antennas. So mm. beyond what's in, 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 in the book that we wrote, and I mean in, in <laughs> subsequent research where well, I more or less left the field after that, but uh, others have, have continued then, uh, lots of their research was like focused on to finding orthogonal codes with, with a better rate than what was um, previously known. Uh, and I, I think it is probably fair to say that the what remains from the field and which is like truly most useful is some of these, now, some of these orthogonal codes, certainly, definitely the Alamutis uh, scheme for, for two antennas, but also a wealth of non-orthogonal codes that have been developed later on and that have a lot higher decoding complexity than the orthogonal codes, but still like manageable, right? So it's possible to win back some of this loss in transmission rate by spending more computational power on the decoding. And uh, uh, so it was a highly vibrant field like 20 years ago. And uh, but it, but it, it, and it did result in some things that are fundamentally extremely useful and are in there in, in the systems and standards uh, that we are building today. Yeah, I was thinking that during this almost 20 years, the 
capabilities of handsets must have been improved tremendously so that some of these uh, seemingly more complicated things might be easy to to implement today absolutely although it's also true that i mean you'll you'll always have you'll always push always push the boundaries right in terms of what you can build and now there's this talking about internet of things and so forth where you build potentially very simple devices that just can't afford to run complicated non-linear decoding algorithms and there's always going to be this trade-off i mean we built something that's very low power and and very computationally efficient and you, you still need schemes that <laughs> can be decoded at low, at low complexity so mm. So uh, I suppose one of the uh, requirements to use the space-time block code is that you have a transmitter with multiple antennas. And uh, nowadays when we have 32, 64 antenna massive MIMO arrays, are these um, space-time codes scalable in the sense that we can apply them in those cases? Has there been some evolution around that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, they certainly scale, uh, right? So there's no, there's no like, real issue around that. But... What is a bit of an issue, though, is that for these diversity schemes of space-time codes and space-time block codes in particular to be useful, uh, the receiver will have to estimate the, the, the downlink channel in order to detect the symbols or, the, or, or to decode. Mm. And that, in turn, will require downlink pilots. And uh, that is an issue if you have a lot of antennas because the, the amount of time ah. frequency resources required for downlink pilot transmission scales in proportion to how many antennas you have at your, your access point, right? So there has been some developments in that field. In fact, um, uh, well, <laughs> one of my students the other year also uh, did some papers and, and uh, defended a dissertation on this topic. So um, there's been... Uh, um, there's been developments uh, which are, are like tailored to how to make these diversity schemes and space-time block codes in particular um, adapted and useful for the massive MIMO setup where we have like 100, maybe even hundreds of, of transmitter antennas and therefore can't afford to to send pilots in the downlink, uh, right? I mean, and of, of course, this issue with not being able to afford pilots in the downlink is a is a big deal quite generally speaking in MIMO as we have talked many mm -hmm. times uh, I mean you and me and also written a lot about and, and it's one of the fundamental reasons for why um, TDD operation is superior to FDD operation for example in, in, in massive MIMO systems right but that is one thing here also that uh, one has to consider <laughs> when applying uh, space-time codes in this context yeah hmm so before we wrap up, I was uh, going to ask you something about our wireless future. Uh, so uh, looking ahead, that new technology components that people are doing research on now, we have had previous episodes on terahertz communications or on reconfigurable intelligent surfaces and things like this. Uh, so do you think a space time block code will have a prominent role in, in any of these technologies or if someone wants to now go and read your book and figure out how to utilize this theory <laughs> in the future, uh, what would be the first places to look for open problems? Yeah, good question. I mean, the short answer is yes, definitely. I mean, why? Because this issue of being able to meaningfully transmit when you don't have chance state information will always be there in, in any future wireless system. And as, as soon as we have like a transmitter which is capable of coherent transmission from multiple antennas, then, well, space-time codes are there as the basic enabling technology for, for, for achieving omnidirectional transmission with diversity and so forth. And I think that's probably also true in the context whenever, I mean, if you have reflecting surfaces in the environment, I'm sure there are many new things you can discover and optimize and so forth. And for Ted Harris, I'm not ex entirely sure what, I mean, as long as we have a coherent MIMO array, then the issues from a COM theoretic perspective aren't really very different from at lower frequencies. If you go it's up more high enough antennas, frequency, potentially. yeah, maybe more antennas. So certainly there'll be like new issues, right? So I think the, the short answer is definitely yes. <laughs> the long answer is that uh, certainly yes, but you know there'll be maybe new issues here to investigate and to discover and and um, something that w we all should should look carefully at i think when when um, designing these uh, future physical layer um, technologies so mm. 
Yeah, I suppose one of the, the new things that are really coming now uh, is that we will have multiple antennas in the handsets as well. So maybe four D terminals had like two antennas with different polarizations, mm. but uh, when we go for millimeter wave or beyond, we will have antenna rays. Yes, good yeah, are, point. Are the space time yeah. codes usable in those situations as well? They certainly are. I mean, but again, I mean, you know, once we enter this regime of lots of antennas and potentially lots of antennas relative to the dimensionality of the channel coherence and so forth, there will be new issues to 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 address. I think so. Still a ripe topic. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> great. So <laughs> yet another episode where we are identifying new <laughs> emerging or interesting research uh, challenges in our wireless future. So do you have anything else you would like to mention on this topic? Oh, not really. I mean, I think you really covered it all here, uh, Emil. So uh, thanks a lot for great conversation as always. and. Yeah, and thank you to our listeners for once again staying with us and, and listen to our conversation. And uh, as usual, if you have any particular questions about what we covered in this episode, please ask them, for example, on YouTube. And uh, then we'll be happy to get suggestions on future topics or questions that we might uh, talk about in some dedicated Q&A uh, episodes as well. Absolutely. And don't forget to like and subscribe us on YouTube and the other channels. So with that, I guess, thank you very much. Bye-bye. And thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.